Thank you for joining me today to hear about this passion project of ours. Education leaders are consistent problem solvers, working diligently for their communities, educators, and students to squeeze every ounce of success out of the investments you're trusted to make. Inevitably, there's always more to be done and never enough time to dream up solutions to every problem. After this presentation, I only hope that you might look at the resources you already have on hand as a wealth of opportunities to capitalize on for your students and the larger community. Perhaps even more importantly, to capitalize on people like me who are ready to volunteer their time when there's an initiative that inspires participation. By day, I'm a design principal at JRA Architects, a firm with 75 year legacy and 30 plus professionals working from offices in Louisville and Lexington, Kentucky. I'm the firm's civic design leader, engaging with public clients to find creative ways to stretch their resources further and build a more engaging, sustainable experience for their communities. Over half of JRA's business is dedicated to education, with hundreds of completed and ongoing projects spread across the state. We're currently working with several districts to deliver innovative, efficient, and compelling new spaces that address today's challenges and set the stage for what comes next. I encourage you to learn more about JRA through our website and the social media feeds that we constantly update with the latest exciting news. We're applying the inspiration we've found in our other work to provide greater resources for your learning environments. We're leveraging necessary infrastructure like this stormwater collection and infiltration basin at the Southwest Library in Louisville to mitigate flooding, exhibit water-loving native landscaping, and create an unexpectedly immersive experience. At first glance, you wouldn't know that the picture on the left is in the middle of a parking lot. We're embracing precious site features like this mature forest that we were gifted at the South Central Regional Library in Louisville to create outdoor shaded learning spaces. The best features are intuitive, where people take to them without being told. We would regularly see construction workers taking their lunches at these benches, proving that the draw of a unique view and some welcome shade connect us all. We're also shaping hands-on, adaptable learning spaces where educators have resources at their fingertips, visibility between learning spaces to coordinate activities, and movable furnishings that support a variety of learning modes. Lastly, the Northeast Regional Library is a great example of how we're finding design solutions that support creative exploration, both inside and out. The use of these face-out shelves and this somewhat scattered layout of the bookshelves really encourage visitors on their first moment in the building to wander and explore. We're also committed to stretching budgets to deliver more effective learning spaces. In this case, you can see the use of colorful flooring and careful planning of the furnishings that create space without having to build walls. And ultimately, that savings in space yielded the investment we were able to make in the outdoor canopy that shades the building and creates a welcome environment opening onto a small park. The lessons from those projects are foundational in what comes next. You're committed to delivering the most engaging, effective learning environments for your students and teachers. Your only limitations, overwhelming as they tend to be, are the time to research and implement new innovations and the money needed to make it happen. It's a never-ending challenge, but you may already have resources on hand that just need a catalyst to realize their additional potential. As one does, I fall into discoveries on the web from time to time. The range of remarkable temporary art is a rabbit hole I can highly recommend and have fallen into far too often. For today, I wanted to share two that were hard to ignore, but interestingly inspire the opposite reaction for me. The first is Andreas Amador, an artist who uses beaches as his canvas to create remarkably beautiful patterns with just a simple rake. His geometric patterns are pretty phenomenal, but I'm partial to his more organic creations, which are often surreal and truly fascinating. Another artist whose YouTube features will vaporize a half hour in a blink is Simon Beck, who's partial to untouched snow. His work is simply a pattern of snowshoe tracks, which, when seen from the right angle and with the right sunlight, are just wild. Other than the shoes, his only tool is a simple orienteering compass. And yet, these are beautiful, but basically off-limits. They're in faraway places, intentionally selected to be unencumbered by people. Now, 
This is, of course, the architect in me longing for these beautiful things to be enjoyed by other humans, ideally on the ground rather than from a drone's eye view or adjacent mountain ridge. And what if they had more durability and resiliency than the next high tide, snowfall, or cloudy day? So enter 2020. Necessity is the mother of invention, and while we all knew it, living a life apart from one another only reinforced the value of shared experience for all of us. We've each tested the limits of our own ingenuity to survive this last year. For me, it begged the question of whether there was a way to seek out that social connection with the wider world, but at a safe distance. Of all the random things, my daughter's overgrown middle school feel just happened to be in the right place at the right time, begging for an intervention. Dreamed up on a driveway with my neighbor one evening. Our guerrilla landscaping partnership was born. Rather than wait for permission, we opted for the uh, beg forgiveness track. Two people, two push mowers, a few gallons of gas, and no particular plan, but we got to work one Saturday morning. The first timer record was just over six minutes, and we had some that clocked in well over 20 minutes, including this poor guy in red here. Our lines weren't so straight, and my mower nearly gave its life for the cause, but we had our maze. In the end, the investment was incredibly low. Through the rest of this presentation, you'll actually see that I've included cost stats in the bottom corner for reference. What was wild after mowing for four hours was that from most points of view, you couldn't really tell that we had done anything. Uh, just that little bit of overgrowth made for a surprisingly immersive experience. This maze lasted a little over two weeks and got a maintenance mow about halfway through. So the realizations here for us we spent that time mowing, it couldn't help but let our minds wander. A few things kind of began to crystallize. This was a great way to get some exercise. Obviously, we all spend however many countless hours over the course of a year out mowing our yards. Using that as an opportunity for exercise was a really fun realization. But just the reality that this was an intuitive problem-solving opportunity that kids could engage with on their own terms. You didn't have to set the rules for them. You basically just had to point them toward the start or the finish and say, all right, find your way to the other end. That uh, ability to offer play as an intuitive canvas for imagination was really excellent. The fact that this was age neutral, other than the frustration, which seemed to be much more heavily on the adult side than the kid side, this was truly age neutral. We saw everybody from two year old to 82 year old enjoy this and often with their family members. So the barrier for entry was virtually non-existent as long as you had the ability to walk. The ability to have safe wandering, which as a parent of younger kids certainly is, is something that I've come to grips with that you don't necessarily want your kids just wandering off over the course of two acres uh, if you're worried about them getting into trouble or finding themselves in an unfortunate circumstance. By having the grass be so low, actually let uh, parents sit on the sidelines and let their kids wander. Something to that, to the notion of intuitive problem solving and play and, and imagination, that having the freedom to wander is, is truly something that really is an engaging thing for younger people. And then, probably most importantly for you, being the kind of caretakers of public investment, is there's no lasting footprint. This got mowed down two and a half weeks afterward, and within a couple weeks, it was back to what it looked like previously. Beyond that, we also had our minds wandering on what's next. Could this be educational and perhaps even cross-pollinate between different creative worlds? Is there the possibility for public institution partnerships, say a school where you might get collaborative learning and collaborative projects that really do mimic the reality of the real world where you're having to work with others that from different backgrounds. Maybe this is even an opportunity to fundraise. Is there a possibility that there's money to be made out there and do some public good along the way? The fact of it being experiential, engaging the public, special community events, outdoor learning environments. The fact that there's the no-mo areas that tend to pop up on the edges of people's properties. There are always these kind of leftover spaces on properties that literally are forgotten or ignored. Is that a possibility for us to take advantage of those so that we're really not even bothering the kind of quote unquote front yard areas versus the ability to have some high visibility? You know, there is real value in having these things be intuitive to visitors so that they understand there's something there to be engaged. The reality of scaling this to every circumstance, I'm sure not everybody has two acres of 
pristine grass just laying around not doing anything for them. So just the reality that we might have to apply this problem solving, this creative outlet at different scales. Could we make this as inexpensive as humanly possible? Yeah, like push ourselves to spend as little money as possible to really prove out, really beta test the fact that this is something that was super impactful for a very low investment. In the end, it's about the engagement, not the maze. You know, yes, this is one way that this could have played out, but this could just as easily have been a different kind of labyrinth. This could have been little pockets of outdoor collaborative space, but we found that this was a way to really engage the public intuitively and inexpensively. Our nearby high school had a no-mow area, just like what we were talking about and, and hoped might be our next challenge. Right along the back side of their property, there were these five and seven acres of just untouched land that's basically left to grow wild. And this was the perfect lo location for our next test case. This time we did get permission. And again, you can see on the screen, the question of topography and graphic design was something that we also wanted to engage in this next challenge to see how far we could push ourselves. Like many suburban high schools, this is a sprawling campus. You can see they have about 47 acres of property. But the, the thing that really stood out to us is when you consider how well its property is being utilized, a diagram like this is pretty instructive that there's a lot of room for creativity. In this case, you can see in green how the leftover land not being used for buildings, pavement, or sports fields is over half the property's area. And almost a third of that open space is typically left unmowed, which was ready-made for our intervention. We followed a few basic steps to test the new ambitions. The first was incorporate a recognizable graphic, in this case, the well-recognized stylistic Atherton A of the, the school's logo. We really wanted to map out a concept ahead of time this time to increase the density of the paths and make the best use of this reduced amount of land. And this was just a matter of grabbing an aerial view off Google Maps and using the listed scale that was down in the bottom right-hand corner to draw a very simple 10 foot by 10 foot grid across the site. In a later project where the tree canopy obscured this aerial view, we used a run mapping app to just trace the boundary. Instead, we basically walked to the perimeter of it and then exported that image to Photoshop, did the same deal with the 10 foot uh, grid. And 10 foot has been really good as a grid dimension as that's about four average human steps. And these paths typically need to be about two steps apart from one another to see the boundaries and, and not get confused with what is what is a path and what's a dead end. Since we wanted the logo's straight lines to stand out, we doubled the widths of those paths that you see here in blue. And then we also opted to just create as intentionally a curvy maze with the rest of the intervention as possible to really make those straight lines stand out. This is just tracing paper laid over that gridded photo. I mean, there's no magic to it. You can see the whiteout that's there. You can see pencil lines that inevitably had a ton of eraser marks that have been washed away. But, you know, there was real value in just figuring this out by hand. And within an hour, we had a, a concept that more or less we followed throughout. You know, really, as long as we had the winning path mapped first, dead ends don't have to necessarily match this path verbatim. It's really just a matter of ensuring the, the winning path stays intact. Once we deployed on site, it was really a matter of a couple you know, very basic tools like a string line to keep our lines straight where we need them to and to give us a basic layout that we were able to trace and then work from. And you can see in the video, this is another scene from that video at the top of the presentation. It quickly gives you a sense for how you know extensive this maze ended up being and hopefully how captivating it was to experience. In the end, the big point here was this was cheap, this was lo-fi, and this was replicable. We really were, you know, felt empowered coming out of this one that we could take this and then push its boundaries even further. Since this was about the same kind of growth that we had at the first uh, spot, you know, could we take it in more extreme directions? So the first one to test was an even more wild experience. In this case, this was a site on River Road right near downtown Louisville. 
It's in the floodplain, so it's basically been left for the past several years to just grow wild. So we are working our paths around the existing tree canopy, and you can see just the awesome shade trees that were all over the property. And then literally circling the little groups of baby trees, we used it an as an opportunity also to clear you know, invasive species as we were going through. And by doubling the widths of the paths you see here, it made it more safe feeling. You know, we didn't have the line of sight that you had at the previous one, so a feeling of safety certainly for parents was ultimately very critical. We then pushed the boundary the other direction. Could you be in a lawn? You're seeing Briarwood Elementary School in Bowling Green, working with Warren County Public Schools to find a way to engage their students in the environment in a more meaningful way, which improves student outcomes, helps with conflict resolution, was a really awesome a test case for them and for us. This is their central courtyard. This is a space that's used every day heavily by their students and staff. Could you make this lawn something more? Could you really push it to perform for them in multiple ways and be something unexpected and thrilling? So you see here the, the two sketches that we had done for them initially just to play out a couple different scenarios. You see the orange is the winning path, the blue is the, the series of dead ends. And they opted for the more condensed, compact, conventional right angle maze because that made the best use of the space. This is only about a half acre, and yet getting through the winning path still takes, if you know what you're doing, at least six to seven minutes. It's not overwhelming, but it is a bit of a challenge. And certainly for some, probably is more of a challenge. With my partner at the Warren County Public Schools, whose focus is on students' mental health and well-being, this was a perfect test case for them to see if this could be a supplement to their mental health and physical education offerings. That This was a place for teachers to be able to practice mindfulness techniques with their students, to come out here and very carefully explore the space and get in touch with their senses. Potential for it to be an alternative discipline. The principal was really excited to be able to take kids that were in his office for disciplinary reasons out instead and just take a walk in the maze. Use that to actually diffuse situations, improve outcomes, and potentially reduce the amount of time that students are in his office. So that was an unexpected thing that came from him that I was really excited to learn was uh, another use for this. And then they used this for staff team building as well, which is just great that it was, again, multi-generational. This wasn't just about the kids. It was about the teachers too. So looking beyond there, that obviously pushed the two ends of the spectrum, the super overgrown and the super manicured. And mazes in the lawn let us be out front, which that last one got us really excited because then we could be in the front yard, really lure people in. Unlike schools, who often have this leftover space to capitalize on, there are so many potential community partners out there that don't have any grass at all, but might be equally excited to create something unexpected and engaging. So we've kept imagining where else this could take us. This is an aerial view of the Lexington Village Branch Library in Kentucky, which is about to be remade as a new heart of this dense urban neighborhood. This is likely a more common scenario, a public location, limited land, never enough parking, constrained exterior maintenance budget, I'm sure. So this seemed like an excellent test case for us to just go through the thought experiment of how would we apply approach this if we were trying to engage with this institution. One of the great things is they do have this opportunity of a nearby park in a neighborhood that is uncommonly pedestrian oriented. So this half mile, this unavailable or unrealistic to expect the public to engage with if we could overcome that distance. When talking with the branch manager, she could imagine engaging the public for special events in the park. And maybe that means that you actually have We'd shown you previously traditional field maze, but getting you from A to B, is it possible that you could have some kind of special event that was as simple as just a story walk, for instance? Just tons of great examples, super inexpensive, where you're just using yard signs. And the fact that this is a heavily bilingual neighborhood, is there the opportunity to even play with language here too, that one side might tell one story and the other side might tell either the same story in the other language? or an entirely unique story. So it's a both coming and going experience. And then the fact that there's the pavement, front stoop, this is undercover. There's the opportunity for concrete to actually be cleaned with something as simple as a power washer and become something special. And then the reality that all of you do have 
is the value of your interior? You know, can you play off of things as simple as the pattern on your carpet to create something that was uh, temporary but memorable? Blouses and sidewalks would offer an even more durable canvas for creativity. There's the amazing opportunity for creative fields to introduce temporary art using nothing more than a conventional power washer. The potential for patterns, collages, or other personal touches could be a multi-step creative project where students created templates and then composed a tiled story that could be remade every year. The fundraising tradition of selling personalized parking spaces to upper-class high schoolers has a similar potential, without the paint, and far less permanent. To test this opportunity, I volunteered my own driveway to see how much maize I could pack into 400 square feet. This was a few hours, free-handed with a conventional power washer, and you can see that, even if the kids lost interest after the first day, the pattern could remain as decorative feature until you're ready to wipe it clean for the next creation. This much contrast came from just one year of dirt accumulation, so unless you're scrubbing your sidewalk annually, there will be more than enough buildup to create. Inside, this gets even more user-friendly since you're taking weather out of the equation. This is just a quick rendering of the children's collection area in that library, with a blue tape maze connecting the dots of their existing carpet. For larger spaces, you could utilize a more durable material, like the carpet protection film you see in the bottom right which can be down for weeks without any harm to the flooring. Figuring out the maze for that previous slide only took about an hour and didn't even require me to visit it in person. All I needed was a photograph of the space, which I then stretched into a flat plan and a photo editing program and printed as an underlay for sketching. A little tracing paper to connect the dots, and I not only had a drawing that the library could use to install the tape themselves, but also allowed me to stretch my sketch back into the photograph for completely accurate rendering to get everyone excited beforehand. We would really want to engage with you and would really want to offer this service at no cost to you because this is where we really see it growing to something more that, you know, this is a small investment for us. It's super fun for us. And we realize it might be a little bit of an, an intimidation to people that wouldn't be familiar with this or might not be ready to take on the responsibility of all, doing all these other steps. We would be happy to help, and this then lets us engage in any way that if you can just send us a snapshot, we can create something and get it back to you, and then you deploy it however you see fit, when you see fit, and as often as you'd like. What's great about schools are that you have these wonderful assembly spaces in your cafeterias, media centers, and gyms where we could create something big enough for a whole grade level to enjoy without sacrificing the room's everyday functionality. You could even imagine how with a little planning and a strong projector, you might even create an in-the-dark maze just projected onto the floor. So I love this video. If you haven't seen it before, this is the Powers of Ten by the Eames Studio. It was an architecture firm. It was really famous in the for their industrial design and their industrial architecture. And this just plays through the reality of thinking about this this world that we're in at multiple scales and seemed apt here because all of the things I've shown you up until now are still things that had to be experienced on foot. You know, they were large enough scale that they weren't handheld and maybe there's an opportunity here for there to actually be something on a smaller scale that we can create an even more engaging experience. Here's the test case. Can we create something that's literally stationary that maybe even engages student age kids to stretch their minds, you know, work on fine motor skills, all those childhood skills that we're trying to build through play, typically. Could we use something like this program to actually engage them? Simple materials, you know, this is just an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, but just the connect the dot kind of exercise, just different colored markers, and again, trying to problem solve your way through it, but without having to actually move. So it's totally accessible and totally available to anybody. The fact that kids want to get down on the ground and you know get their imaginations going, could it be within an arm's reach? Could you have a maze that was printed on some kind of resilient material that could be dry erase markered on? So one day it's a, a matchbox car map, the next day it's a basis for your Lego table, and the third day it might be a tapestry that you hang on the wall and kids can do the maze with dry erase markers. Again, something that's adaptable and inexpensive and really plays to the imagination and, and a variety of experience so that it doesn't get stale. Every time somebody visits, it might be something new. 
as the kids get older, they want to be working on their own. Maybe scaling up is an, an additional feature of a multi-purpose activity wall. Here you'd figure out the winning path maybe with the dry erase marker and then have to create a magnetic gear contraption along the winning path perhaps. Then to take a digital makes it available anywhere. Do you deploy activities through the digital classroom environments that you've all just mastered over this past year? Your smart boards can always use another activity, but imagine that you could even have a school movie night where you project a maze on the side of a building and everyone brings their laser pointers to figure it out during an intermission. The potential for academic cross-pollination is so exciting. We already see that coding, parametric design, and robotics are truly where this project goes next. So why not have LEGO Robotics maze time trials at the end of a term, or even the basis for an after-school club, perhaps? We've already begun working with a local high school to build an interdepartmental project that could be an annual curriculum event, a collaboration that might incorporate creative writing, graphic design, mathematics, and video production to conceive, execute, and document their creations. And then beyond that, how can we take this program directly into your materials? This is the diagram of a Choose Your Own Adventure book, but it would be a really fascinating maze, especially if the kids could experience the story while literally traversing this framework. Now, this is something I lifted directly off the internet, and right off the bat, there are so many different ways you could take this where it could be just a monochromatic maze. You could still have the color involved. You could even challenge kids to find their way to either an ethical or moral outcome in the story or create dead ends that weren't expected in the book. And literally, now all of a sudden, you're living, you're walking through a story. And, you know, again, where could that take you? We don't know yet. But this could be everywhere from something handheld to something walkable and be really remarkable. You know, could it even be a summer reading program opportunity where it's part of a summer reading list and then all of a sudden they can walk it at last week before school starts, perhaps. The ability to tie this into more conventional academic exercises like learning multiplication tables. You're a resource to the community for additional educational resources. Can this be more fun? Can you be the place that has fun ways to engage with the material? There's an opportunity here for supplemental resources that have things as simple as a maze where you're learning multiples of three or any number. And again, that's just a photocopy and, and off we go. And maybe it's no maze at all. As we start coming back together, can we leverage these outdoor spaces as multi-purpose amenities, a place to gather, a place to create, a place to explore? We've begun engaging with our local Walden School here in Louisville on a plan to create more immersive outdoor learning spaces in what has always been just a mown lawn. And I can't think of a place more appropriate than something that's trying to eschew Emersonian ideals than trying to return a lawn to a more natural environment and engage students in a more meaningful way in their environment. So, you know, again, something as simple as chopping a, a log, you know, perhaps there are outdoor classrooms surrounded by a labyrinth or a maze or a uh, wandering path that, that takes you through different environments, different shade qualities. As I mentioned earlier, nearly everything you've seen was accomplished for next to no upfront cost using conventional household equipment. If you want to mow a wilderness, I would recommend the bush hog you see on the left, but otherwise a mower will almost always work for something lower than that. That string trimmer, the second picture there, basically just a weed whacker on wheels has been my MVP tool as it cuts tall grass just as easily as lawn and uses a fraction of the gas that a conventional mower does. So basically where we were the first maze using conventional mowers and having to go over every spot at least three times. With the string trimmer, it's basically guaranteed that you're only gonna go over a spot two times. You go through with the string trimmer and then follow with the lawn mower and you're on your way. I can't emphasize the last image enough given your positions as there's a world where you might engage your friends members or other volunteer forces so that it's not a direct liability or staff responsibility for your system or maintenance effort for your staff either. There are people like me out there everywhere that are just waiting for that spark, like I try to touch on throughout this presentation, to engage in what you're doing, the meaningful contribution you're making to your communities. So what comes next? We'll see where this next year's takes us. We're currently arranging a partnership between Louisville's public schools and local architectural community to have a maze weekend where firm partners have a school assigned to them different corners of the city and have an open house event where all of a sudden we'd have 10, 12 mazes mowed on the same weekend. 
map that's distributed through all the local public school, email and, and text blasts, and now all of a sudden it's an opportunity for these to be destinations even when they're offline for the summer to really be ways for the community to engage one another. You can three, see the three stars there. Those are the high schools we've already begun engaging and you know obviously Atherton already has had a few mazes but we're really trying to canvas the entire community and, and bring this to any school or any institution that's interested. You know again this is not something we're trying to force on people but there are people out there that have really gotten excited about what we're trying to do. We're working with Ball State University, uh, my alma mater, which has the unique responsibility, if you've seen in the national news over the past year or two, of actually running their local public schools. They took over Muncie Community Schools, and in an effort to partner with the College of Design, who already has student groups, volunteer organizations, engaging with those schools directly. You know, could we actually, for this instance here, you see the highlighted quad right outside the College of Architecture in the heart of campus, you can see the bell tower there. This is the center of campus. Could you put this in the front yard of campus, get the students excited, but then also bring in the administrators of the various schools and get them excited about this program and then basically hand off this knowledge to the students to run with it and kind of make it theirs and let it perpetuate. The students are always coming through. They're, these organizations will stay there forever. Why not let this be something that's a living experience and share this with as many people as possible? We continue to push our previous partners to consider even more exciting creations, like the Storm Basin Parks in every corner of Louisville. Signature locations like the base of the Big Four Bridge, which give you an aerial view for everybody. And hybrid cross-country learning and play environments with our partner in Bowling Green. What you see there on the right is actually the courtyard of the school we mowed just last fall. But what's exciting is that main property has this wonderful backyard space that will be just a spectacular opportunity to, again, explore topography. There's a, a small creek bed through there, and all kinds of really wonderful tree cover that is a really awesome opportunity to create both outdoor learning environments and potentially even you know, nature walks and other things beyond just uh, doing the maze. This is admittedly a bit of a leap from where we are today, but my personal dream is to spend the last portion of my career creating an experience as remarkable as City Museum in St. Louis. If you haven't been, you have to go. It is inspiring, challenging, occasionally claustrophobic, and just undeniably fun. The picture on the right is an installation in the Smithsonian from a couple of years ago. I can't help but imagine something like this, made from perhaps recycled materials and housed within an eccentric abandoned factory building somewhere in one of the cities in the region. It's so fun to think about and uh, so much potential to be someplace that could be truly engaging to the public. and a remarkable destination and landmark in a community of ours. For the time being, however, I wanted to thank everybody for having me here today. Uh, and even if you're ultimately not in the market for anything you saw here today, I hope that this will have helped you find inspiration in your familiar surroundings and perhaps take a chance to connect with your communities in an unexpected and fun way. Certainly invited to scan the QRs on the screen or follow the, the links to the website or emails to learn more about JRA and the work we do, as well as the Maze homepage where you'll find links to connect in all the ways we do these days. We're up for just about any challenge and incredibly interested in hearing how the spirit of this project could be even more applicable to the work you do 